Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, I'm going to talk about what I do in the garden when we're going to get a serious heat wave. I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, zone 7B, um, and the temperatures here in mid-June average somewhere around 89 to 91 degrees, somewhere in there, and it's jumping up to 99, which isn't all that, un all that unusual. It just hasn't been there uh, at all this year, and so I wanted to go through and talk um, about, I've never done a video on just you know, heat tolerance and, and, and how to deal with heat uh, in the garden, so I wanted to do this here. It can be 104, 105, 106 here as well, <laughs> which, which would concern me more than this, uh, honestly, this brief four or five days we're gonna have in the upper 90s, but let's talk about it. One of the main things, uh, and I don't care whether we're talking about cold or talking about heat, is building resiliency in your garden. And the way you build resiliency in your garden is building topsoil. So keeping the ground covered with mulch, um, compost, um, you know, th those, those things work to, you know, to prevent weeds, but they keep your they keep your they keep your roots warm in the winter. They also keep them cool in the summer. They also hold moisture in place, and moisture, of course, is an important part. Where we're going to talk about watering in just a minute. One big thing uh, about um, uh, plants' ability to uh, withstand these types of temperatures are two things. One is age. You know, if you have very young plants, they're definitely going to be more vulnerable to cold, more vulnerable to heat. You know, that that, that seems pretty obvious. Uh, more established plants are going to be more resilient in the landscape. But the other thing that builds resiliency is planting kind of heavily. Uh, if you have a single tree out in your front yard in the lawn that's mulched, um, that tree, every single time you mow your grass, those roots on that tree are getting burned by the sunlight uh, on a hot summer day. And so having your trees in larger beds and then underplanted with plants in layers. So I've got this service berry tree out here in the front garden. It's small. It's new. Uh, but it's underplanted with, with shrubs, like a second layer. And then below that, um, there are smaller shrubs, ground covers. Each of these plants is working together to shade the roots of the plant that's next to it. This is how, you know, if you look into a wooded space, uh, you don't see one big giant plant, you know, um, you know standing by all by itself, you know, uh, uh, with, with, you know, with the sun, you know, blaring down on its roots. So each of these plants is working together. And so keep that in mind when you're designing your landscape, you know, instead of putting a tree in a circular bed in your front garden, make the bed larger and then have it layered down uh, where each of these layers are protecting each other. Your ground cover layers are being protected by the shade of the tree and the tree roots are being protected by the shrub layers. So that, that's how we build resiliency uh, for cold and for heat. I don't talk a lot about lawns uh, on this channel, but one thing I will point out is being careful uh, to not take a lot um, off when you're mowing. Uh, you want to leave, you know, if you're, if whatever type of turf you have, let's say it's fescue uh, and it's recommended that it's, you know, you keep it between two and a half inches and four inches. In the heat of the summer, you definitely want to lean toward that four inch height. Um, my, you know, for me, I've got a, a, a zoysia grass and I want to keep it right at, so right at the, the, the highest recommended uh, mower height. And part of that is just to shade the roots because every single time you mow it, you know, you're, you're mowing off a top part that's been in the sunlight and exposing part of the grass that has not been in the sunlight. So it's like staying in the house. And I'm going to talk more about this when I talk about pruning. It's like staying in the house through the winter and then going right out to the beach without sunscreen on. You know, you're more vulnerable to being burned. It's the exact same thing with your lawn and your plants. If you go out and scalp it off on a hot day, it's going to be far more vulnerable. The roots are exposed. The lower parts of the grass, the, 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 the leaves themselves are, ex, you know, are now exposed to more sun. So you will do more damage to it. Leave it at the maximum height. You're better off mowing it couple times a week if you can. You see golf courses maintain grass super low by mowing it very, very frequently. So they never take off more than a third of the blade, even 25% of the blade at the time. Obviously, when it's really, really hot outside, uh, you're going to end up with thirsty plants. And so watering is going to be, you know, one of the main concerns uh, during a heat wave. Early morning watering is the best, uh, is the best time of day uh, to do that. And saturating your plants thoroughly uh, is, is, a, is a good idea. Uh, you don't necessarily, if you have, 
established beds, plants that have been in the ground for, you know, shrubs that have been in the ground for two, three years, uh, your beds are well mulched. You're not going to need to water those things uh, every day uh, for sure. So, you know, um, but my, this, this landscape project is less than two years old. Uh, and most of the things haven't been in the ground uh, for that long. And so I kind of know the newer things. I know the things that kind of struggle. So, you know, I pay attention on a day-to-day -day basis. There are some plants here that are still trying to establish themselves and, you know, and, and need a little bit of help, you know, on a hot summer day. Obviously the plant needs, you know, lots of water uh, up, up, in the, up in the top of the plant. That's one of the reasons we're watering. It's also to keep the roots cool. And uh, one way that happens is during the day, we get evaporative cooling. So, you know, it's hot outside, water is evaporating. If the plants have moisture around their roots, in the mulched areas, in the beds, that evaporation actually cools the air around them. When I had my nursery, I did a lot of propagation. Propagation is just taking, cut, taking cuttings off of plants and rooting them. The, you would walk into my greenhouse, uh, which didn't have any kind of air conditioning system, and at head height in, on a summer day, even when the fan's running, it might be 105 degrees in the greenhouse. And you're like, how in the world can these plants be surviving? But my rooted cuttings were right on the ground floor. And um, there was wa it, the, the floor was kept wet. And that evaporation went on all day long. And so down at the ground floor, it was only maybe 75 degrees and head high uh, in the greenhouse, it was like 105. And so that evaporative cooling uh, that strategy of evaporative cooling works fantastic. If you have plants on a patio, on brick, on concrete, around a swimming pool, you can actually go and spray that concrete down around them and that will create that evaporative cooling around your plants. It's a great strategy. It's a strategy I used in my nursery. We would turn the water on for maybe two, three minutes on a zone just to wet the fabric around the plants and that evaporation would cool those uh, pots off uh, and so again, I'm going to come out here, select the plants that I know I need to water, and I'm going to water thoroughly. And I don't want to water just at the base of a plant. This is, you know, a lot of times what we're seeing, you know, when we're thinking about watering. This dogwood's been in the ground for two years now. The roots are over here just as much. Uh, the roots over here are just as important as the roots right at the base of that plant. So when I say water thoroughly, water out at least to the drip line of the plant if it's a plant that you know may struggle one thing i was talking about resiliency this plant in its first year in the ground here really did struggle because it none of its roots were shaded here and so when we got a heat wave last year it went into more of a drought now you can see it's shading uh, its own roots i've left this is i know a heat tolerant or uh, a plant that's not that heat tolerant and so i've left the limbs down toward the base on it and I'm trying to keep the, uh, you know, it, it's, it's shading its own roots. Other things that are growing around it are also helping out with that as well. Water thoroughly in the morning. I've already mentioned keeping the ground covered uh, as an important component of, of any landscape and mulch. Uh, but you can have living mulch. That's what I was talking about, about having a layered uh, bed where you can have trees and then you can have mid-sized shrubs and then you can tuck small shrubs under those and then you can have ground covers down at the ground. So this sedum is an example of a living mulch and you think it's going to outcompete everything or it's going to demand more water and it just doesn't. That shading of the ground uh, holds water in place and having this many things in this space there's a lot of rooting going on down into the ground and when we do get rain or do water we get more water infiltration uh, down into the ground. Again, if you have a single tree out in the, uh, you know, your front garden space and you have a big giant lawn and the lawn gets walked on all the time when you're mowing it or ridden on with a riding lawn mower, those compacted spaces are where water runs off. Uh, these types of beds like this that are built with multiple level uh, pieces and are, and are planted pretty tight, the water falls into it and infiltrates it. So there's more actual water stored here um, I'm gaining more water storage uh, that way. And so in this, this, so there's an example of, you know, of a living mulch. And then over here where there is bare ground, I have, you know, this, is, this happens to be a little bit of pine bark mulch I used for these annuals, but you can use hardwood mulch, you can use uh, cedar mulch, you can use pine straw, whatever it is. We're trying to keep the ground covered with organic material. It can even just be plain compost. Or, um, but, but that, you know, anything we're doing to, um, 
slow the evaporation and uh, keep the roots cool. I mean, here's an example of some Swiss chard. I'm in the middle of June right now. We've had 95 degree days several times. Uh, these are not the most heat tolerant uh, plants in the world, but their roots are shaded um, and they're being protected by the other plants around them, basically creating a microclimate. And the water that's in this bed is doing that evaporative cooling thing that I'm talking about. So, you know, down here at the ground, it's not as uncomfortable as it feels to us when we're walking outside. One of the main strategies I've always employed uh, in combating heat is using things like shade cloths. Uh, this is a, uh, a black shade cloth that, uh, it, this is a 50% shade cloth, so it blocks out approximately 50% of the sun. You'll see these in nurseries hanging up above plants that need to be grown in the shade. I'll just lay one of these shade cloths across things that are heat sensitive. And so my, as an example of that, I have potatoes growing in grow bags uh, that I'm going to uh, slide this over the top of because the longer I can, 99 degrees will definitely shut my potatoes down. Uh, and uh, if I can get another week or two of growth out of the foliage on the top, I'll have more potatoes. So that's, that's what I'm using this for. If you're, st if you're in a cooler area and it's gonna jump up hot really quickly and you still have some lettuce or some cool season vegetables, this would also be something you could use for that. You can buy this you know, and, uh, as a black shade cloth cover like this. This one has lasted me. I mean, I bet I've had this thing over, over 20 years for sure. So these are very long lasting. You can also buy the white row crop covers. They're available on Amazon or wherever. I'll, I'll link some of that stuff uh, below that are effective for covering plants, maybe extending the season of cool season things uh, a week or two longer. Your containers are very vulnerable um, because th think about, you know, what, I, what I've talked about, about mulching and watering and helping to insulate the roots. Well, in a container, your plants, you know, are the roots are above the ground. And so something like this thrown over a container uh, will help with that. You can throw, you could possibly use a sheet, again, a row crop cover, or alternatively, you can take all your containers in a heat wave, slide them over to a shady space, put them pretty tight together. Uh, and uh, that they're also easier to water in one place. And of course, um, you know, they'll, have, they'll be offered some protection from the direct sun on their roots on a very hot day. One thing that can really help with heat stress is some minor pruning. If you, especially if you have a newer landscape, you have newer planted things. If you're finding something that's just wilting every single day, and you're constantly having to, uh, and you're constantly having to uh, water it, it might be best just to take a pair of head shears like this. Like on this azalea, it's, this is not wilting. It's been in the ground for a while, but uh, just as an example, just tip prune it. Take an inch off the end of each of the branch each of the branches where it has this newest growth. And that will lower the need for water greatly because most of the water that's being used by this plant is in this new growth, okay? So uh, that is a great strategy, especially early on. Sometimes it's even worth sacrificing flowers. If you plant a gardenia in full bloom, which gardenias are blooming right now, you will find that it either has to sacrifice those flowers or it has to sacrifice some foliage. It's not going to transition well on, during a heat wave. And so it's probably best to take those flowers off or it's best to enjoy it in a container uh, flowering and then cut it and then cut it later. Uh, things like big leaf hydrangeas, I think you can see the blue hydrangea over there. They tend to wilt in the afternoon regardless. You know, on a 99 degree day, 100 degree day, like we're gonna have in the next few days, that thing's definitely gonna be wilting in the afternoon. I'm not gonna panic about it at all. Uh, I'll water it the following morning if it needs water. The way I go about checking that is I'll just go you know, pull some mulch back underneath it and see if it actually needs water. Uh, it, it really, it's because of the large leaves and the inflorescences or flowers uh, on top of it um, are do, you know, it's growing a lot right in, a, in the middle of a stressful situation. So it just, it can't keep up. And so normally by the time the sun goes down in the evening, it perks right back up uh, and it's totally fine. One other thing I want you to think about here is monitoring. I think that, um, we panic during cold snaps and heat waves and things, um, uh, you know, and, and worry about things. But I think this is actually an opportunity to learn about your landscape. There may be, it may be that you've put things in places where it's just too hot for that particular plant. Could be that it's next to a, because it's next to a driveway or a hard surface that's reflecting heat or light onto it. That can be also the case on a west facing wall during the summertime that the heat 
you know, it doesn't cool off at night on a west facing brick wall frequently because the heat, the, there's actually heat held in the bricks. And so you're going to find microclimates in your own landscape. You're going to find where some marginal things survive the winter well uh, because they were slightly protected or something that should have been totally hardy in your area gets damaged every winter because it's in an open space. It's going to be the same exact thing during a heat wave like this. You're going to find out that some of your plants just don't like where you've placed them. You don't move them during the heat wave, okay? Uh, you wait, maybe wait until fall to move them around or late summer to move them around, but do take notes. This is a learning opportunity. When you have abnormal situations, uh, weather situations, it's a learning opportunity. Uh, when you get too much rain, when it gets too cold, when it gets too hot, I'm looking uh, and examining my space. I sold plants for many, many years and people had no idea how much sun or shade a space got in their landscape. You're about to find out, you know, when it gets really hot. So keep an eye on things, see how they're performing in the spaces that you've put them in. And it's okay to move things around uh, later, move puzzle pieces around, or identify it as a space where you want to put some ground covers in, where you want to underplant them and see if you can build some resiliency through planting your garden uh, thicker. So uh, there you go. I've never done a video on you know, heat tolerance in the landscape. Uh, one last thing just popped in my mind. If you have hanging baskets uh, and you're having to water your hanging baskets like twice a day, when it gets really, really hot like this, I would take your hanging baskets, drop them down to the ground in the shade of your front porch or someplace in a shady space uh, and let them spend the day uh, without going through that stress. You know, when the, when the temperatures back back off again in a week or so, you can go back to having them hanging uh, all day long. But that's one thing uh, on your hanging basket. So thank you guys very much for following along uh, with the channel. And uh, I think there's, I think there's things to learn, uh, you know, in your garden when the uh, weather becomes unpredictable. Thanks for watching.